Just uh, this week, uh, another study uh, found that almost all of our baby foods are, are poisoning our kids with heavy metals. You, you want to talk about heavy metals yeah. for our listeners and why that's so important. It, it's funny because people hear heavy metal, like I said, they think it's music or they, they sort of have this idea of maybe mercury or lead or something, but it's just out there and, and I haven't been exposed. But if anyone listening to your show right now were to get tested, they are not going to have zero levels. And yet over the last 20 or so years, the Environmental Protection Agency said, oh, the safe level of, of mold was 20 parts per billion. Oh, I'm sorry, we meant 10. I mean, we, we meant five. <laughs> and now the, the statement is there is no safe level of lead. And even a small increase in lead increases your cardiovascular disease risk very meaningfully. It lowers IQs in kids. And it's synergistic. And this is the bad thing about toxins. If you have lead and mercury, or lead and cadmium, or lead and thallium, or nickel, or tin, <laughs> all of these things, you might have a safe level, but not zero of this one, and a safe level of this one, but together, they interfere with cellular biology to the point that it creates inflammation, and inflammation is at the root of pretty much every bad thing that happens, starting with prediabetes, then diabetes, which blows up your risk of all of the other, what I call in superhuman, the four killers. And you're very well familiar with this. You know, what's gonna kill the average person who hasn't read one of your books, who doesn't do the basic stuff, it's pretty much gonna be diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, or Alzheimer's. Like those are the big ones, or you know, a car accident or something, yeah. but that's a much lower likelihood. <laughs> Yeah, and so what, uh, help us out. How, how can we limit our exposure to this? And I know the number one thing you're gonna tell us is don't eat kale. Uh, you know, kale just tastes bad anyway, <laughs> so we shouldn't eat kale just because, who wants to live to 180 years if you have to eat kale every day? It's probably not a good trade-off. All right. <laughs> uh, the number one thing wouldn't be don't eat kale, but, um, and you've explored this, I and mean, there are plant toxins. Uh, and you're one of the major voices out there, 100% accurate. And one of the plant toxins, aside from lectins, is um, oxalic acid, which is not a heavy metal, but it's a toxin in kale. It turns out, though, there is one plant that is better than any other plant so far discovered that pulls thallium, which is a toxic heavy metal, out of the environment, and it is kale. So people who eat a lot of kale, in addition to kidney stones and gout <laughs> and uh, vulvodynia, and maybe other forms of inflammation from tiny crystals floating throughout your body, they actually can have elevated thallium levels. And thallium is called the poisoner's poison. And it's not something that we really had a problem with in our environment, except <laughs> when we figured out lead was bad for us, we pulled lead out of our gasoline, hallelujah, except they replaced it with thallium, which is a thousand times more toxic than lead. It's just less famous. So I'm not saying don't eat kale, but I am saying if you're gonna live on kale, it's probably not gonna help you. So if you love it, cook it, dump the water, and eat it a couple times a week. And it's just fine if you tolerate that well, but if you're thinking you know, the kale salad three times a week is going to save your life, it can increase your thallium levels. Functional medicine doctors who do testing regularly do see elevated thallium in kale lovers. But the big smoking gun here is clearly lead paint chips, if you eat guacamole with those, that's not how to do it. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's not it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fish. And the reason for this is that we've been burning coal for a long time, especially this so-called dirty coal. And it goes up into the air and it rains down into the oceans. And then it goes into the food chain at the very bottom of the food chain. And then the small fish accumulate a little bit. And then a big fish eats them and accumulates a little bit and a big fish eats them. And these are things in us, we're the same way. It goes into our tissues and it stays there. So your job, if you wanna to live to at least 180, which is my point in superhuman, it might be possible. In fact, I think given some advances that are coming our way, thanks to pioneering work, including frankly, robotic surgery is getting to that. There's all kinds of cool tech coming in that's gonna make humans live longer and longer and we're, we're just the beginning of a, a renaissance of this anti-aging technology space. But if you were to go in and expose yourself to 180 years of eating fish that have eaten fish, that have eaten fish, that have eaten fish, you're gonna be 20% mercury by body weight. Uh, not really, but you're gonna have enough of it that you will not have a brain that works. You will have Alzheimer's disease and probably cancer. So should you not eat fish? Well, you got no omega-3s. So what do you want to do about that? You want to eat fish that didn't eat that many other fish, sockeye salmon, 
sardines, anchovies, small fish. And when you do eat fish in the book, I talk about some things you can take that will stick to the mercury in the fish in your gut so you can poop it out instead of having it go into your brain and maybe eventually pulling it out. So there's a, you know, if you're going to enjoy some fish, you might even have some sushi. But when you do, you can do some preventative stuff with it. And it, you don't order the swordfish. You don't order the shark. You don't order the big tuna. Although, frankly, I had a piece of tuna the other day. I put it on Instagram, and I had a big handful of chlorella, which is a fractured cell wall algae. And the reason I know that chlorella works, in addition to the studies that show it binds, is that years ago, I had a very advanced yoga practice. And if I ate sushi, that day... If I or the next day, if I tried to stand in a one-legged pose with my eyes closed, I would tip over. But if I had chlorella, I wouldn't tip over. And it was very repeatable. It's like the change in your practice, the subtle changes at the edges of your capabilities. That's where these toxins hit you. They're sneaky, but they also take years off your life, and they take we'll, we'll say life off your years, because if you end up with Parkinson's or MS or any of these other things associated with toxins, uh, Alzheimer's in particular, man. Your quality of life just went down. Whether or not you got more years, it, it doesn't matter that much because you can't remember the last ones anyway. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I've been uh, interesting. Uh, um, the the two biggest offenders for mercury in in my practice are dentists and oh. and sushi eaters, and <laughs> because they you know they like the fatty tuna and uh, you know sashimi sashimi grade tuna. And I've used chlorella now for 20 years, and there's not a person that I, I can't get their mercury levels down using chlorella and activated charcoal. And I think you're right. I, I take chlorella every day, um, and I think everybody should. Uh, but it's a great way to bind mercury. It really is. Dr. Gundry, I just, hats off. <laughs> you're, you're a surgeon. You, you're, you're a, a very well-credentialed Western doctor, and you've been doing this for 20 years, and anyone who looks at you, just look at your skin, look at your body, look at the sharpness of your brain, and you are doing something different <laughs> than average, and you have been for longer. And, and, and this, this is the, the point that I really wanted to get across in Superhuman, is that, look, you're not gonna look 20 years younger tomorrow, but if you just take less cuts, if aging is death by a thousand cuts, Take less cuts, make them less deep, and instead of just slapping band-aids on them, heal them better than Mother Nature intended. So you're still gonna take cuts. You might have some sushi and love it, but you took your chlorella. So you balanced it out, and maybe you got a little bit of mercury, but you can deal with that. So it's just, you don't slap yourself in the face over and over, but you can still have a fun life. And so my, my horror movie is the caloric restriction people. The guys who say, I'm gonna eat one third less calories than my body really needs because I think it's gonna make me live longer. I'm cold all the time and I'm rail thin. Uh, I've got you know, vegan sized pants because I have no calves left. And, and I'm really grouchy. You know, <laughs> exactly, and it's, it's not worth it. We don't have to do that to live longer. It, you're supposed to be just radiating energy and, and you do. Every time I've ever talked with you in person or on the air, you're like, you're, you're living it. This is what it's supposed to be like. And, and that, that's something that metals will take away. Yeah, no, great point. So speaking of living longer the right way, you focus on mitochondria a lot in your new, new book, as I have. What's so special about mitochondria? What, what are these little guys? <laughs> well, mitochondria are, we like to call them the power plants in our cells. I and mean, this is a, every, every author, every newscaster has said that, but they're way more than that. In my view of them, after having written out one full book on mitochondria in the brain, and then uh, superhuman focusing them as a major part of aging, these are also the batteries to a certain extent. They're, they're storing a certain amount of energy in them that they're recycling very quickly, but they also sense the environment around you and then make decisions on how much energy or other chemicals. Mitochondria actually can manufacture things like neurotransmitters and hormones. and they're embedded inside your cells, anywhere from a few dozen at the very low end up to 10 or 15,000 mitochondria in some cells. And in women, you can have 100,000 mitochondria in the cells uh, in the ovaries because they have to send the environment the most to pick the right egg and to provide all that energy. And, and they're, they're amazing. They move, they move themselves around inside the body. They shuttle little energy production things back and forth. And we just found out in a study that came out two weeks ago 
something that is, is a, a thesis for superhuman, but we didn't have a study for it yet, uh, which was that when your mitochondria work better, they provide enough energy to the nucleolus, which is a part of the cell, and that is responsible for your DNA repair. In other words, if your mitochondria can make the amount of energy they're supposed to, you know, air plus food equals energy, that energy will go into DNA repair. And if they're bad at taking food and air and making energy, that means pre-diabetic, means toxic metals, it means mold toxins, it means any metabolic dysregulation, any inflammation, then you don't have enough energy to repair your proteins. And another study was published today that came out that said, you know what? It turns out that errors in protein folding are an unacknowledged cause of aging. Yep. We always theorized it, but some people proved it. You probably saw the study today too. And, and so what's going on here is, hey, what if your power was better? What if you were better at taking food and air and making energy? You'd have more energy right now, even if you're 25, even if you're 105, and you are not going to decline the way you think you will. And you get the benefits of more energy now. It's, it's kind of a good deal. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So we need to have our mitochondria happy and working. So listening to this podcast, is there anything our listeners can do right now to make their mitochondria yeah. happy? One of the things you can do that is very low cost is you can sleep effectively tonight. Because the mitochondria, there's a quadrillion of them or so sprinkled around in your body. And they all have to coordinate themselves. Think of it like a Tesla. These cars have uh, uh, thousands, actually, of little laptop batteries underneath the car. And they all have to work in unison. Well, you're the same way. So what is the timing system? It turns out there's a part of the brain called the SCN that is the major timing system for your mitochondria. And if they all know that it's daytime, then they'll all make energy. And if they all know that it's nighttime, they'll go into repair and reset mode. But if some of them think it's daytime, some of them think it's nighttime, you're going to be all over the place, both mentally, hormonally, metabolically, and it doesn't work. So what do you do to fix that? Turns out it's all about light exposure at night, and to a certain extent, it's about food exposure. So tonight, instead of staring at your bright screen, turn your TV screen down. Put on some sunglasses. You might notice I'm wearing glasses. I started a company called True Dark that makes glasses specifically for sleep. But you don't have to do that. Make sure you have the darkest curtains you can get. Most people don't know this. The amount of street light that leaks around normal curtains, a very small amount of light, increases depression by 63%. At least it did in a study in Japan of 800 adults. So make sure that your curtains aren't leaking light. If you have to put Velcro around the edges, that's okay. Unplug the LEDs, tape them over and sleep in a pitch black room, and you're gonna wake up, even if you still got your normal six hours, seven hours, eight hours, however much it is, your quality of sleep will be better. And in Superhuman, I write about how old people sleep versus how young people sleep, and I post my scores. I get more deep sleep and REM sleep than the average 20-year-old gets in eight hours, and I'm getting it in six and a half hours. Why? Well, I measure it with my ring, and <laughs> I black out my room. if you got your aura ring on too. Yep. So, this doesn't cost much to sleep in darkness, but man, it will change your mitochondria. You'll wake up tomorrow with more energy and a better regulated system. Um, the other thing you can do right now is you can say, tomorrow morning, I am going to skip breakfast. You will not go into starvation mode. You will not die. <laughs> <laughs> um, you might get hangry. You might get hypoglycemic, And if either of those happens, then that means that your metabolism really needed you to do that. And you should, the next day, have a nice breakfast with no carbs, no sugar. And the day after that, try it again. See, what you're doing is you're building metabolic flexibility and you're doing something called intermittent fasting, which is a very powerful technique for fixing all kinds of metabolic problems. So let's see, you slept better by turning off the lights and dimming the lights and you skipped breakfast. And you can do black coffee, you can do tea, you can do bulletproof coffee if you want the extra energy from that, but no sugar, no protein, not even collagen protein. And when you do that, you're going to see changes. No, I think that's great advice. Uh, skipping breakfast, I think people say, well, gosh, I'm gonna crash. Well, if you crash skipping breakfast, like you say, that's a warning sign that, holy mackerel, you have <laughs> no metabolic flexibility. 